When it comes to BMX racing, do you guys have the race tactics and savvy to race offensively and defensively? And what does it mean to race offensively or defensively? And what are those skills entail? In this video, we're going to we're going to dissect a recent race over the weekend and give you some examples to enable you to race better and smarter. Let's talk about it. All right, guys. Hey, welcome back to another Tuesday night edition of BMX Coach Live. I'm your host, three-time Olympic coach, Greg Romero. And listen, if you guys are watching us on the replay, thanks for joining us. Make sure that you guys ensure that you guys subscribe and also hit the bell notification so you guys know when I go live or when I post. All right, so this is a live video and we always have an audience in the chat room and they're always gonna join us and ask awesome questions as it pertains to BMX racing and questions. And listen, can we talk about racing tactics and more importantly, offensively and defensive tactics and when to use them? Do you guys find that would be helpful? All right, well, let's, let's see what's going on in the chat room here. We have JP coming in from Canada. Uh, Connor Nyland, Marino Valley News first. Again, these are YouTube handles, so they never give me your, they, they rarely give me first and last name. Some of the guys from down under, like Matt McCluey, uh, H. Smitty, Luke Bockelman, Jacob James, David D. says, what's up, coach? What's going on, guys? Man, hey, welcome to the show, man. I'm excited to be here. I'm so grateful and honored to be your coach. And Man, I had an awesome week. Had an awesome weekend of watching the race over in Rock Hill, South Carolina. USA BMX had an awesome weekend of racing. Looked like they had like a record-breaking 432 motos or something like that. They didn't even get done until midnight on the first day, which I believe was Saturday. So impressive. And on top of that, they had um, they had the elites, right? So they had pro men, pro women, and then they also had the national championships on Sunday. Plenty of action-packed race week. Uh, plenty of action-packed racing over the weekend man i need to say that three times fast and so i saw a lot of racing happening over the weekend some of it was controversial some of it was really good that track is really good in terms of inviting a lot of action if you would um there was a lot of a lot of passes to be had, a lot of defensive racing, offensive racing. And you know what? I, I wanted to talk about offensive racing and defensive racing. And hopefully by the end of this video, you guys will be able to understand a little bit more on how to race with your head rather than your legs, right? Like it's all about racing with your head come race day. You know, you guys do all this training, all these gates, all these sprints. Um, you do the, you do the strength training, right? You Some of you guys who are older old enough to... Uh, to do squats and to get into the gym, you guys are working on your legs. You guys are doing all this work, working on the motor. And it's important that you guys constantly and consistently work on the tactics. You know, what are the actions are you going to take on the track if a rider is in front of you and there's an op there's an opportunity for you to pass them? Um, you know, wh what's in your tool bag if you're fourth place on the outside and three guys bunch up in the first turn what are your options are you prepared to respond and react properly and appropriately so in this video you know i, I want to really give you guys some some insight right give you guys some some more depth give you guys some more depth into your racing and that way when you guys are out there racing you guys are not only in the moment but you guys are able to think one or two steps ahead kind of like if you were playing chess right if you ever play chess you're always you're always thinking two or three moves ahead and in bmx racing you know things are happening unfolding right in the present moment but you're able to predict what's going to happen two or three steps ahead you're almost able to predict what's going to happen even even the next straight right so when you're going into a turn and you're coming out you already know what that rider in front of you is going to do. If you guys have, um, you know, any kind of sensory acuity on what their style of riding is. And so there was a couple of things that I saw over the weekend in South Carolina where, you know, some guys race aw awesome, right? They, they were, some guys race really well defensively. They were able to get out front 
and hold their lead and take smart lines. Um, some guys were able to take the lead and not take smart lines. Some guys were able to be in second and be all over the guy in first. However, they weren't taking the smart lines. And so I want to be able to dissect a few, a few laps over there and give you guys some insight. Cool. Let's check out, see what's going on in the chat room. People are still coming in. Thunder Midget, Days Rock, David Burt, Audrey, Trey 527 says, what's up, coach? Hey, welcome, man. I haven't seen your name before. Jeff, Jeffrey Roden. Lots of familiar faces. Again, man, I'm so glad and honored for you guys to show up. Really grateful for you guys to be here. Um, let's see here. What can, what should I bring up first? I, you know, I'm going to go ahead and bring up this race from 26 to 35 expert. want to go over a, a quick tactic that I think a, a lot of you guys um, could easily contemplate and, and consider. And you may find that, you know, these kind of tactics will, will help you in terms of trying to achieve uh, overtaking someone in a corner. And here's a here's a lap from the 26 to 35 expert class. I'm playing it slow motion. So this guy here, he gets the whole shot. You'll see this guy in second who's wearing this blue and yellow Supercross kit. And he just, he gets the vision, right? Look, he's already zoned in on where he needs to go. He needs to get underneath that, that rear wheel. And that's it. It's, it's really that easy. I, I, I need to play that over again. And... Um, then over here, the guy, the guy that he passed, he just doesn't give up. He just overtakes this guy. And yeah, this is just a really good race. The guy in first just had a lot of track speed here. And you can see here, I would love to see this guy in first close the door a little bit more. And that way he doesn't give the guy in second an opportunity to get underneath him. Other than that, I thought the guy in first raced really well. And the guy in, the guy in second raced really well. I mean, he just didn't have it all. He just, he just, he just wasn't fast enough than the guy. Uh, down the third straight. Now let's go back to here. If you notice the guy in, uh, in the blue and yellow kit, he actually jumps his double. So when he jumps it, he's able to get his wheels down on the ground quickly first. And he's able to start turning the bike as opposed to manualing, right? Um, if you were to manual, you'll have to wait for your front wheel to come down and then you have to turn. I feel like if you were able to jump into a pair of doubles, as soon as, as, soon as your wheels touch the ground, you can, listen, when you're jumping, you can actually start jumping across in the angle in the direction that you want to go, which in this case, this guy did an awesome job. Let's see if I can get it back to the beginning again. He did a really good job getting underneath um, the guy in first. So let's see if I can get back to this. I don't really have the ability to hit pause on this, but watch. So the guy in front, he manuals. The guy in second, he's able to jump and he has both wheels down already looking ahead. I thought this was brilliant, right? He was already thinking ahead, two steps ahead as he was going over. When he was going over the triple step, going up it, he was already planning his move. It wasn't like, oh, he landed on the backside and then saw the opening, right? And sometimes that's the thing. It's like, oh, I see the opening. By the time you see the opening, it's already gone. You already have to have it set up, you know, 30 feet back when you're entering the, when you're entering, when you're going, when you're beginning the jump, right? And starting to enter the turn, you already have to have that move in your mind ready to go and see if it is an option. You have to be able to look two or three steps ahead when it comes to passing. Let's see. Yeah, here it is. So he's already thinking pass. I'm going to look for his back wheel. I see it clear going underneath it, right? If he were to be like, oh, you know what? It's open. You know, he wouldn't have been able to execute this pass as clean. And I really love the way, like, he came out. He took, the, he took the line away, and he did everything he could to hold off this guy in second. Really, I think at the end of the day, the only thing this guy can do in the blue and yellow is just work on his track speed a little bit more. And, you know, he's, he's racing really well with his head. It's, it's great. And then again, he doesn't give up here. He, he goes for the same move again. Right? He sees it. Unfortunately, he's just a little bit far behind and, you know, sometimes it, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So really, really love that one. Let's see here. I want to take a look at men's pro. What do you guys say? Yeah, Thunder Midget says textbook move in that corner. So what's going on, man? Okay, so here's the men elite with uh, Connor Fields. Now Connor Fields is going to hole shot. He's not. He's not what we're going to talk about here. He did a great job. I want to. I want you to focus on the guys in 
second, third, fourth, and then Jarrett Gar Jarrett the Jet Garcia going from fourth to almost first, but he really gets second coming out of this corner. I thought this was brilliant. I thought this was really good, right? Like he had the foresight. Let's see if I can play that again. No, nope, I can't rewind it. But he had the foresight, right? And then the race is just, it's crazy because there's three guys. And of course, my video, my head's covering these guys. Let's see, this is uh, Cameron Larson that emerged from the the group of three guys here. Now he's in second. I think that's Van, Van Kamen in third. And then Jarrett, the Jet Garcia, back to fourth. So Jarrett goes from fourth to second, back to, to third to fourth. And I, I don't think he gives up. You guys can't see my mouse, but this is really good racing because Van Kamen, of course, you can't see. Maybe if I do something like this. Okay, let's let's do this. So Garcia's in lane eight. All right, he's in lane eight. And what he's going to do is as soon as he gets over that triple step, he's going to look left. Okay. I would say about right here, he's already thinking, look left, what option do I have? And he already sees the line, boom, he cuts underneath. This is pretty much like a high-low or an X-pass, right? Really, really good move, beautiful move. And then the thing that Jarrett doesn't do over the other guy that has an orange uniform as well um, is that he doesn't commit on moving all the way over on him. I wish he would have done that. I think he got hung up on that double right there, and I think he would have been in front of Cameron. He got hung up on that double, and that that cost him some speed, and that pushed him back into the fourth, honestly. But if he would have, if he would had moved over and took it all the way to the white line through the pro section, I still believe he would have preserved second, despite the fact that he cased. It, it, it certainly he would have preserved that. He would have at least preserved third, and then going to this last corner here, Van Kamen tries to go around Cam, which I think is really good. He's ahead. He's ahead, but Cam doesn't give up. Doesn't give up. He pushes Van Kamen. I think this is really solid racing. And then he takes him to the white line, right? Look where look where he's at right there. He's just taking the white line, taking the real estate away. And this is really, really smart racing. Looks like Jarrett got third. He came back because Van Kamen got held up in that, in that corner there. Let's watch out one more time, guys. Please forgive me for this. I don't really have fast forward features on this. I have to edit this in like Adobe Premiere and then I have to import it into my system here. But yeah, again, I love it, right? Like, again, racing with your head, thinking ahead, boom. It's open, he's gonna take it. He already had that plan in his head. Trust me, he was already thinking about that in the gate. He, he already has that as an instinctive option. The only thing I wish he would have done was just get right on Connor's Connor Field's wheel and cover that inside and commit to coming over on Cameron a little bit. Cameron gets underneath. Van Kamen's back in the mix. And this is just an awesome race for second between these guys, for between the three guys, two, three, and four positions. Really, really good. Cam takes a really nice inside line, takes that option away. And then Van Kamen's forced to go to the outside and he's just... He's going to carry as much speed as he can and see if he could go around them. And really, at the end of the day, this is all he's got as an option because because Cam's already covering this the inside there. You know, my father always told me, make sure you cover the inside and make him go around you. Cam does a good job, pushes him on the outside. Van Cameron loses speed and Jarrett does not give up. He does not give up. He takes it all the way to the line and still gets on the podium. Beautiful lap. Let's go to one of the more controversial laps over the weekend. This one. All right, is that better? Oh, man. Man, I've been talking the entire time. Can't hear me. Please forgive me. All right, guys. So um, let's go back to this. So Cam Bramer. Man, now I have to repeat everything I said, guys. <laughs> Again, I thought Cam Bramer defensively, right? Wrote a really, really good race defensively. Um, took all the smart lines. And he did exactly what I would tell my riders to do. If you get the whole shot... The idea is that when you go down these straights, you want to think about getting really close to the white line. Listen, the handlebars are, you know, anywhere from 25 to 28 inches wide. You know, that's eight inches to the right or left of your tire, roughly speaking, six to eight inches. OK, and so if you ride the white line and then move over about a foot, 
Okay, that entices the guy in second to try to get underneath you there. And 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 I love that move because if if he bites on that inside, he ain't go he ain't going to go around you. All you have to do, you could feel him and just move over on him a little bit. Unfortunately, Cam got disqualified here, but again, if I was his coach, I'd tell him to do this 10 out of 10 times. I say, Cam, do the same exact thing that you did coming out of that last corner. Ride defensively smart. Look, when he comes out of this first corner, he rides he rides the inside here. Leaves just enough room on the inside to lead to believe that the guy in second can go, go underneath him. Coming out of the second corner, this is great. Nick Fox in second thinks that they're, he's led to believe that there's room there on the inside to go underneath there, and, and there just isn't. And then he tries again. Nick Fox tries again to go to the right of, of Cam Bramer. And what I like about this, let's focus on the defensive part here. I really love the defensive moves that Cam Bramer did here. He he did exactly what he's supposed to do. Cover the inside. Cover one side and commit to one side of the road. He didn't ride the middle of the track. If he, if he would have rode the middle of the track, he would have got passed. He would have got passed down this third straight. But no, he picked one side of the road, chose the inside, and didn't necessarily ride the white line, just kind of, just a little bit to the right of the white line, just enough to lure the guy in second to lead him to believe that there was room on the inside. And that way, he can kind of control him, right? If Nick Fox was to go to his outside, then he has outside control, right? Again, if you guys go down the middle of the road, you really don't know where the guy's going to be, especially if you're wearing goggles, right? The guy could... You know, you're you're basically inviting the guy in second to operate out of the element of surprise, and you don't want that. You don't want any surprises. You want to be able to control and have outside or inside control of the guy in second. Does that make sense? Here, Cam Bramer has inside control. I don't think he did anything wrong. I don't think he did anything wrong. And we'll discuss that here in a second. Again, defensively, let's focus on what Cam did. Came out here. Had inside control coming out of the first turn. Now, Nick Fox did smart here. He went to the outside. All right. And then he railed this corner. And then he thought he was going to be able to get underneath him on the inside to the left of Cam. And Cam, Cam didn't let it happen. Right. He covered just enough. And then coming out of this, I would have loved to see Nick Fox offensively go to the left of Cam. Go to the middle of the road where there's more real estate, man. Oh, if he would have done that, he had the track speed. He was faster than Cam down the last straight. Down, you know, he showed that he had more speed on the second half of the track. Dude, just go to the left or right of him. Just commit to one side. Go to the middle to the outside of the guy in front of you, Nick. That would have been awesome because you would have blew right by him. You guys wouldn't have crashed. Well, you wouldn't have crashed. And you guys would have went one, two instead of seven and eight. Again, there's no such thing as failure, only feedback here. So... You know, I'm not trying to get critical. This is just what I see. Now, you know, it's a coin toss, right? Like Cam got got DQ'd. You know, that, that call can go 50-50, right? Because me personally, I didn't see Cam doing anything wrong, all right? It wasn't like he went like a Mercedes-Benz windshield wiper and just fully wiped the guy out, okay? It wasn't like, you know, Nick Fox went to his left and... and Cam started right and then started started to drift to Nick's left and then took him out. Cam just left enough room to lead Nick to believe that there was room to go underneath him. Therefore, Cam had inside control. You, 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 again, your handlebars weren't going to fit, man. He hit the back of, of Cam, uh, Nick's handlebars, hit the back of Cam's hips and, and he just Ran out of ran out of real estate, ran out of track. Bike went out of control. Now, the one thing that I think Cam, the reason why I think Cam shouldn't have got DQ'd is that Cam never looked back. You know, if you look back and you move over on somebody, that's a DQ, but Cam never looked back. He just held his line. Again, that's a coin flip. What do you guys think in the chat? Should he have been DQ'd? I don't know. What do you guys think? Thunder Midget says, Nick Adams, Coach Nick Fox is park. <laughs> Sorry, please forgive me, Nick <laughs> Nick Adams. Yeah, exactly. Please forgive me. Yes. All right. Test, 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 test. test, test, test. All right. So the audio works. <laughs> All 
All right, cool. You guys have any questions about this, right? Is this making any sense? Offensive writing, defensive writing. Um, you know, I, I thought in the first half here, offensive, defensively, these guys did really well. And then in the second turn, you know, again, Nick, I'm, I'm sorry, um, Cam, Cam rode defensively all the way through. I think he did the best that he could with the track speed that he had and the skills that he had. I, I thought he rode really well with his head. No complaints. I, I, again, if I was his coach, if I was his team manager, if I was his parents, I would be like, dude, do that 10 out of 10 times. Okay. And then as far as the guy in second, Nick Adams, please forgive me. I didn't mean to call you Nick Fox. Um, I don't know. I don't know why I said that, but Nick, man, I, I thought in the first half of the track, you rode really well out of the second turn. Listen, man, you had the track speed. I think if you would have just committed to the right side coming out of that second corner and ride more offensively uh, minded in terms of taking advantage of your track speed, I think you would have rode by cam going into the last turn and, and you guys would have finished one, two. And, you know, you guys had like 61, 62 riders, right? That was a big class. Great opportunity if you guys are going after the national uh, number one uh, title, right? Cool. Chris Durham says, bad call. He was racing his lane. Yeah. BMX 2525. I watched from like five views. He just kept his place. Sebastian, my type of offense. Jeffrey, looked clean to me. Me personally, I, I think at the end of the day, like I think it's, it, there's grounds for a disqualification. Again, if he would have looked over and then deliberately moved over, right? Like you can't do that. You, that's just not going to fly. But I thought it was smart for, for Cam. He came out of that corner and he just took like, the, if this was the white, let's see, can you see my hand? If this was a white line. He just rode here. He didn't ride in the middle of the road. He didn't, he didn't come out here. He came right here. Just, he didn't ride the white line. He just left a little bit underneath there to lead to believe that, that Nick can come in between the white line and the handlebars and it just wasn't there, right? It just wasn't there. So I thought I thought defensively Cam rode brilliantly. I, I thought it was it was awesome. It was great. And yes, I think Nick, if he would have went left, he had the track speed, he had the fitness, he showed the fitness. He would have blew right by Cam. If he if he would have just swung left coming out of that turn and just commit to that, there was plenty of room between the last turn and uh, the finish line to get by Cam, for sure. Kale Thomas, yes. What rule did they cite to DQ him? You know, I I asked, I went on social media and asked USA BMX because when they when they posted it, they were like disqualified for actions. It's like what what actions? Like what is what does actions mean to you, ABA? I'm excuse me, USA BMX and whoever made the call what is what does actions means i would love does anyone know if you guys are watching this on the replay i would love to know if you guys can type it out yeah uh, matt says no way solid riding in defense william bs call jp difficult to say from this angle i agree i would love to see the, the the dead on angle um should i have not been disqualified uh h e smitty said um BMX 2025, I would say no because he was keeping his line and place. I already said that. Um, yeah, Kale Thomas, been cut off way worse myself. Man, you know what? You're, you guys are lucky. You guys didn't have to race John Purse, man. He, he he would punt you over the corner and you wouldn't and he wouldn't get disqualified, man. Like back in the day, they were really lenient on calls. Now today, you know, man, this this is a tough call. It's a really tough call. Cool. What do you guys think? Are you, are you guys finding this helpful? Right on. Cool. Well, let's, uh, I want you to ask your best questions. Let me know how you guys are using your tactics, right? When it comes to passing, what are you guys doing? Are you guys thinking about what kind of, what kind of, are you guys looking to pass in turns? Are you guys looking to pass in straights? How are you guys riding offensively? And also, how are you guys riding defensively? Are you guys integrating and using these tactics now? I want you guys to think about that. Let's, let's, let's create more dialogue 
and ask me some questions and we'll begin the Ask Coach G section right after the break. Hey guys, I have a question. What would it do for you if you could enhance your power out of the gate, enhance your sprint speed down the first straight, enhance your skills, enhance your mental performance mind state? What would that do for your racing or your kids racing? If you're seeing the value of enhancing your BMX performance, consider joining the community of BMX Training Pro and get the same access my Olympic athletes have enjoyed, as well as thousands of BMXers all over the world. Some members use the access to improve their gate start techniques. Some also use the access to keep them motivated to train. And you'll find your reason when you gain access and join BMX Training Pro today. Stay focused, get ready now. For real, get ready now. Nitro with the nice flow. Stay focused, get ready now. For real, get ready now. Yeah, let's go. Stay focused in the heat. Come on. Concentrate to the sound of the beat drum. Start it up. Take it back now. Check, check it out. This is how it's going down. Yeah. All right. Checking out some of the action going on in the live chat room. David Burt says, Vet Pro had a few good races as well in South Carolina. Man, you're right, man. I, I should have got that. Barry Nobles was riding really well. Um, so was Andres Jimenez and the Mosquito. Uh, man, I think there was like three passes in that race. And they were just all three just dicing it out. It was great. And also David Burt said, you always want to be two steps ahead. Exactly. I think at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to achieve here is get to the point where, you know, number one, um, well, our goal would be to be able to race with our head, right? And an effort to do that, we have to start integrating tactics, right? Start thinking about what what moves and tactics we're going to use, you know, on the track and practice this while in training, while you guys are at the track. You know, it, it, it always behooves you guys, it always behooves you guys to practice your your passing lines, your inside dives, your your mid lows, your high lows, your X passes, um, and then also we discussed earlier in the video with the 26 to 35 expert you know, there is a difference when you guys are going over like a step double or a double going into a turn, manling versus jumping. You know, like if you were to jump, you get both wheels on the ground quickly. You can also jump across at an angle. And as soon as you land, you can start, you can start going underneath the guy in front of you, right? That's like a, a like a mid low or an X pass, right? And so just working on those tactics, working on working on the skills of those tactics right again like if you guys were to go across a double practice jumping across and you don't want to do it to where you're taking out guys behind you but certainly in practice you guys can work on jumping across jumps going into turns and then when you land try to land close to either the hay bell or the cone or whatever's on the inside of the turn man i need to create a video for that one i think that would be pretty rad but those are things that you guys have to work on because if you guys don't work on it, then unconsciously it's not going to happen, right? Like you're just not going to pull that move out of nowhere because again, just like our man, David Burt says, you have to be able to think two steps ahead in an effort to think two steps ahead. You already have to have those tools in your tool bag, in your toolkit, ready to go, right? We're like a computer. You know, we, we spoke about the the emotional, mental, mental, mental mind state side of ourselves. We are a computer. So we want to be able to download or rather upload all these awesome different programs of different tactic, tact skill sets, right? Passing, right? Um, in the corners. And, and, and of course, when you guys are coming out of corners and making sure that you guys are having the awareness of where you are at in terms of the road, right? Or you're on the inside, the middle of the road, or on the outside of the road, okay? Where are you at as it pertains in between the white lines? That matters. When you guys are coming out of the turn and you guys commit to, you know, left, center, or, or right, or right, center, whatever, right, middle, left, you know, you guys are influencing the riders behind you in which way they're going to go, right? Like what Cam Bramer did there was 
you know, he, he decided here's the white line. I'm just going to go right here between the middle of the track and the white line. Just go right here. And that way, if you go, if you try to go between the what myself and the white line here, good luck, buddy. There's, there's not a whole lot of room there. And all I have to do is just move over an inch if I feel you right. Or you're going to run into his hip and you're going to come off the, come off the bike or lose control. Or if the guy goes to the outside, then then he has outside can control and he can kind of gradually provided it's not like the last straight he can kind of move over on the guy and push him high going in you know down the next straight all the way to the next turn and then you know the next turn he can kind of like fall away from the guy right he could fall away and he can open up more space when he comes out of the second corner so you guys want to think with your head where you're at in terms of the road Right side, left side, middle. Where are you guys are? Where are you guys? Okay, and then from there, you know, see how that influences the rider behind you. Okay, work on that, and then of course work on your turning moves. And then all of a sudden, if you guys are conscious about this all the time when you guys go out to the track, then the more you guys practice this stuff, then the more you're going to be able to do it without thinking. Again, again, BMX, man, there's so much stuff going on, man. You have to, you got to ride the bike, you got to ride it smooth, and you guys have to be a pilot and, and race against the other guys. It's, it's complicated, man. It's a complicated sport. It, again, it, it's like it's like ice hockey. You got to know how to skate, got to know how to handle the puck, and then you have to be able to skate and handle the puck around other players and obey the, the rules of the game. Very, very complicated sport. BMX racing is not an easy sport. Ah, oh, man. All right. So where are we at? Where are we at? What do we have for questions? Let's see here. BMX Beast 200. Love that name. One thing I've noticed Coach G with training kids is teaching them the high-low technique and how hard it is for them to understand how to properly cut and make the move. How can I explain this to them? <sighs> yeah, I, you know, for me, the way I do it, I'm a coach that likes to co like that. I'm a coach that likes to start at the fundamentals, right? So, like, are they able to cut down across the flat part of the turn technically and comfortably? Okay, are they able to do that first and foremost? Okay, boom. Check that box, get that out of the way. Next, what you want to do is you want to be able to get them to look ahead and then look for the opposition's back tire and then aim for the inside of that tire, right? Because if you just say, oh, just go high and then go low, you know, then they're more than likely the rider is kind of glued to too much on just going high in the turn and then coming down low, right? It's one thing to do that, but listen, a high low, you don't necessarily need to go that high. You don't necessarily need to go that low. You just need to be on the outside of the opposition's tire. Look underneath the tire, wait for it to clear your front tire. And then that's when you have the, the opportunity to cut, on, cut, on, cut underneath, right? So that's the thing. You have to be able to look for the opportunity. Now you could set up cones. You know, lots of lots of coaches, lots of lots of clinics set up cones to where it's like, okay, you know, for me as a coach, you know what I do? I'm always the guy that's getting passed. So me personally, I'm I'm riding my bike. I'm making sure that guy's to the right of me. I ride I ride up I ride up high on purpose, and I say now, and I have him cut down underneath. I just make sure that you know, as as a coach, I'm able to control the environment a little bit more and ride up high purposely. Because if you send another rider off and they're trying to, you know, if you have two riders, the guy in front, he don't want to get past. He's not going to make it easier for you as a coach for for the for the for the guy that's trying to make a pass to learn that easily. So, you know, you as a coach, or you you have to get someone. Uh, or if if you're not on the bike, get someone that's on the bike that's able to 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 follow directions and go up high in the turn and just get that rider comfortably getting underneath. And just watching the back wheel. Hopefully that helps, man. Thank you so much. Let's see here. Um, as it pertains to tactics, let's see. Uh, let's see. Cruz and Omar, when do you know when to be satisfied versus keep pushing to pass? 
the right. Point. That's a great question, right? Like if you're in second and you know, you want to get first and you're going into the last turn, for example, is that what you're trying to ask? We see that all the time, right? The guy in second's trying to make a pass that's not there uh, for first. And it's like, dude, it wasn't there. Maybe, maybe you should wait till you come out of that corner, come out with a little bit more speed, go to the mode and just try to pass him down the next straight, right? It's hard. And, and that's the thing. Uh, something tells me that most of the time, most of the time, these guys are just not, they're just not practicing this stuff at the track, right? They're going to the track, they're doing gates, going all the way to the first straight, first turn, shutting down, calling a day. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm guilty of that too, but you know, I've always, I've always been blessed when I was a younger rider growing up to ride with older riders in a parking lot situation. And we would just do figure eights. We would set up a track in a parking lot and just race each other around, right? And, and, and just try crazy stuff, right? Try swinging out really wide and just taking some super silly aggressive line trying to get underneath and, and execute a pass. Riders need to develop that mastery of knowing Number one, what tactic to use. Number two, having the sensory acuity, having the ability to read the race and know, hey, this is going to work in this situation or no, it's not going to work. Let's go to plan B. Plan B is I'm going to drive it a little bit deeper into the corner, maybe take a couple more more pedals going into the middle of the turn, rail the corner and, and come out with more speed and try to pedal as fast as I can, as soon as I can out of that corner try to create more track speed and get in front of the guy in front of me, right? Like you have to have a plan A, plan B, thinking ahead. You have to be able to understand, you know, you have to be able to understand, do you have enough, are you close enough to the rider to make that pass? You have to be within, you have to be within this bubble, if you will, right? You have to be in this bubble in an effort to create and make that pass happen. If you're out of the perimeter of the bubble, probably not going to happen, right? So you have to be close enough. That's that's the key. Thank you so much for that question. I thought that was pretty good. Oh, here we go. Snowman 2727, last turn 2007 Elite Men's Maine and Victoria. Do you think Kalen Young would have passed Kyle if he hadn't double manualed the step double? Ooh. Yeah, I, I think that's a tough one. I, I think either way, that was going to be a, a really close race. I, yeah, if, if Kalen... Did please forgive me? Did Kalen bobble that that step double going into the last turn? I think I I need now you're gonna now I need to bring that video up and and maybe play that next week. But yeah, I don't know. That, I think at the end of the day, you know, Kyle was the guy that had the track speed. That last straight in Victoria was really technical, deep. It was really it was a really long last straightaway, and there was a lot of mangling to be done. And it was a lot of deep manling and, and Kyle had the gas, he had the fitness, he had the speed and endurance, and he had the skills to to make it happen. I, I think it might have been inconsequential what Kalen would have done if he would have doubled or mandled going into the last corner. I think if he would have doubled into it, take a couple um, deep pedal strokes going to, into the turn and railed it and came out with more speed, I think he would have had a fighting chance versus Kyle's last straight tactics. BMX 2025, 25, 25. He asked, what would you recommend on holding your place in the rhythm when someone's on the outside of you? I've had issues with this when constantly racing men. What do you mean by that? Jacob James, outside foot down is a good choice for lower center of gravity. You'll be able to handle getting bumped. I agree. Are you talking to somebody in the... Jacob's always talking about, always talking with someone in the live chat. I love it. Okay, here we go. Here's some feedback on the on the race with Cam. Matt McClue. The rule they use to DQ Cam Bramer is rule number 27. When on the final straight, a rider determined by an official to have intentionally impeded on the progress of another rider may be disqualified. Yeah, so it's very subjective, right? I think at the end of the day, the official had the ability to say, you know what, the guy in second was going faster and the guy in first, you know, despite the fact that he got rear-ended, he impeded his progress. So, you know, it's... 
inferential reading between the lines kind of kind of a thing there right like super subjective um you know at the end of the day i think a lot of people could have looked at that um either way you know uh nick adams ran in the back of him or cam bramer impeded his progress but yet cam bramer you know he chose to uh pick the right side of the road be within six inches of that white line and and not budge from that line guy in second comes up and tries to fit in between and all of a sudden Cam Bramer is at fault of impeding progress. I don't know if I agree with that. Now that you bring that up, the the one thing that Cam didn't do wrong was, you know, in an effort to show or demonstrate that you're impeding progress on the guy behind you, is doing the guilty look back, and then like, oh shit, I need to move over on him. When you do that, it's over, right? You're busted. When you look back and move over on someone, you're busted. That's a dead giveaway. But this other one here, yeah, it's it's a coin toss, right? I mean, it's it's really it's really subjective. And the one thing I should play this, uh, the one thing I did notice when I watched that video the first time I was listening to the announcer, when when Cam and Nick Adams were going down the third straightaway, Nick Adams did the I'm sorry, Cam Bramer did the same thing on the third straightaway that he did on the last straightaway. He went to the white line, but just left enough room to entice Nick Adams to lead him to believe uh, that there was room between uh, the white line and Cam. And so when that was happening and and Nick Adams was running up on him, the announcer goes, oh, Cam, I should play it because I don't want to I don't want to mince the words of the announcer. But he said something to the effect that Cam is riding defensively. He he said something to the effect that Cam was riding. Well, shoot, maybe I should just play the video. Why, why should I even bother? He said something to the effect that I, th I thought this was interesting. Here, let me play. Oh, Bramer riding smart right there, making him hit the brakes, jamming him up. That's exactly what the announcer said as these guys were entering the last turn. Let me play it one more time for you guys. I, when I heard that, I was like, ooh, the power of preeminence. And the official heard that, so the official's eyes were like, oh, is he? Oh, I I is he? <laughs> is he hitting his brakes on him and jamming him up? So the announcer didn't help out Cam Bramer. Did you guys hear that? <laughs> Go in the chat and let me know. Did you guys hear that? When he said that, man, I was like, ooh, whoever the official was, again, the power of preeminence, their submodality of, of, of auditory, they heard that, and all of a sudden they lead to believe that, hey, man, the guy out front is riding dirty. Let's see what happens down the last straight, Right? He was on his P's and Q's looking for, for Cam to do something wrong. That didn't help the announcer. Unbeknownst to the announcer, was that was that Eric Eric Grindle? Is that is that your fault, man? Yeah, man, you, you pretty much ruined it for Cam. Cause I watched that part and it's like, dude, he didn't. Nick Adams wasn't hitting his brakes. He didn't hit his brakes. I guarantee you he didn't hit his brakes down the third straight. He had way too much momentum to hit his brakes. Right? There was no breaks to be had. Kale Thomas. Yes, I heard it. Luke, C. <laughs> Jeffrey Roden said yes. Yes, JP says, I thought he said jamming him and making him hit his break. Yeah, man. <laughs> the announcer didn't do Cam any favors there, did he? Good stuff. All right, guys, any questions as it pertains to um, tactics, offensive writing, defensive writing? Are you guys finding this helpful? Are we getting clear, right? At the end of the day, it's all about practicing this stuff at home. 
and getting to a level of unconscious competence where we have mastered it, where we can access these tactics and strategies without over without overthinking it, right? Being able to go into a turn, going up a jump, going into the first turn and already thinking, oh yeah, I'm gonna jump across this jump. I'm gonna look for the inside. I'm gonna, I'm gonna run right underneath dude's back tire and give him an elbow and make the pass. And, th- and here's the thing, when it comes to offensive riding, man, you guys have to commit. If you guys are gonna make the move, commit. When you guys go in and only, you know, at a 95%, like I'm just gonna do this 95%. I'm gonna see if it can happen. I don't know. We'll just see what happens. Dude, that's when you end up falling. That's when your elbows get, I see it all the time. People are non-committal and then they just come off the bike. It's like, dude, just commit to the move. If, if you're gonna fall, you're gonna fall, but commit to the move and at least move the dude out of your way or a girl out of your way. Please forgive me. <laughs> all right, any questions? Let's see. Let's see. I know there were some other questions that were out of context of Jeffrey wrote, and he had an off-topic question. I love off-topic questions from time to time. It, it kind of freshens things up. We have we have time for a few more questions, and then of course I have a dinner date on Tuesdays. I don't cook on Tuesdays because I have to set up and get ready for the show. So therefore, you guys now know when I do this show, I'm leaving. I'm gonna go get get something to eat. Jeffrey Roden asked a little off topic, but how should my nine-year-old Noah old structure his practice time? And how much should I allow him to play? Okay, so didn't mean to pause and make that that's, this question sound weird, but I'm gonna repeat the question so you guys understand it clearly. A little off topic, but how should my nine-year-old, how should I, how, how should my nine-year-old structure his practice time and how much should I allow him to play? We practice two times a week for two hours each. Oh, that's easy. So, wow, two hours? Two hours uh, at the track? That's a long time for, for a nine-year-old. Um, I would just cut it in half, right? Like 50-50. So first hour should be all structure, um, whether you're working on skills, uh, whether you're working on gates, whether you're working on fitness. And then after that, it's like, hey, man, Go do what you want to do. You guys want to you you want to work on jumping and work on doing some turn bars and getting rad. Let him do that. Let him have fun after the fact. And I think that's a great idea, Dad. And at the end of the day, you know, even professional hockey players they do this all the time. You notice I always bring up hockey. It's one of my favorite sports. If I wasn't racing BMX, hockey would have been it for me. Um, same attributes as BMX: explosive, contact, a lot of stuff going on. Um, but one of my favorite hockey players. Uh, a guy named Sidney Crosby for the Pittsburgh Penguins, they do the team practice. And then once they wrap up team practice, which you know is roughly anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour, he'll spend an extra half hour working on skills, working on skating drills, working on puck handling skills, just working on his game, right? And having fun with it. Maybe he'll grab a couple other players and they'll just do stuff that's unstructured. And so I, I think it would be cool, Dad, if you just, you know, maybe focus on jumping one day. Hey, let's focus on manuals. Let's see how far you can manual, you know, and just have fun with it and just and just play along. Um, get a few riders involved in and, and have a friendly competition. Um, or, you know, break out the video camera. Let's practice some jumping. Let's see how rad you can get. I think he'll really appreciate that. I think a balance of, of structure and playtime is key when it comes to BMX racing, especially if you're under 12. I mean, shoot at all ages, right? Like I think it's 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 important. Some of my Olympic athletes, Corbin Shira, when we were done weightlifting, he wanted to go hit the trails. Out at the Olympic Training Center, we had trails, we had everything, right? Um, but, you know, weightlifting, I, I think on Fridays we would do like, we would do a few movements, do some core work, and then for fun, we would go ride trails. And I'd bring my camera out and I'd be his number one fan. Try to get some video shots that he can post on in, on Instagram, you know. What other questions do we have? <laughs> Matt, 
Matt McClute, when when do you suggest switching from offense to defense? Listen, if you're if you're in second, second, third, fourth, you know, that's a great question. But for the most part, if you're in second place and and there's not a whole lot of people behind you, and this is gonna get tricky, but I, I'm really smiling because you really like lit something up here. If you're in second, you're always on offense, right? If you're in first, you're for the most part, you're always on defense. And defense isn't a bad thing. If you're riding in the front, I want you to take the smart lines, but I want you to look ahead and keep going after that finish line, right? It's a race to every obstacle. It's a race to every inch going, coming out of the turn, going in into the turn and out of the turn. You're always trying to be first if you're racing. So, you know, in terms of defense, you're just making sure that your lines that you're, cho that you're choosing are making it harder for the guy behind you, okay? But your leg speed, you know, your line choice for the most part, your your mindset, your thinking offensively, right? You're 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 trying to get to the next obstacle first before the guy behind you. But defensively, listen, you're you're just trying to choose lines that make it hard for the guy behind you to pass you. That's all you're trying to do. If you're in second, you're always on the offense. You're always hunting. You're always going. You're always looking for a way to get underneath the guy in the corner in a creative way and try to integrate an element of surprise. The problem is when you when you go from the motos to the quarters to the semis to the mains, the competition gets harder and then the racing gets more bunched up, especially in the pro classes. If you guys watch, if you guys, you know, someone brought up Barry Nobles, his first vet pro win. Awesome stuff. I think it was on the first day. Was it Friday? Or Saturday, I don't know which day it was, but you guys can go on USA BMX and check out the main events. Barry and and the Mosquito and Andres Jimenez, the guy that was in second was racing offensively to get in front of the guy in first, but he also had to be defensive on the guy in third. And that's the thing, right? It's like, ooh, it's really hard to toggle between offense and defense because if you're gonna try to make a move and swing out wide, on the guy in front of you trying to pass for the guy in first, the guy in third can go a, can do a two for one. All of a sudden you're 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 trying to go for first, you're in second, but you end up in third, right? That's that's when racing gets really interesting, and that's when you learn a lot, you know, in terms of strategy. And it's awesome stuff. Like it's it's important for you guys to always be getting film uh, with your racing, right? Like the guys at USA BMX do a tremendous job filming and I think it's good for you guys to, you know, for all you dads out there, get a good dad cam. A cell phone doesn't always cut it, but get a cam that you could zoom in on. You can get one for under 500 bucks and film all your kids' races. You guys that are older that don't have a dad showing up to the races, take that cam, take that dad cam and hand it to someone else and have them film all your races. That's what I did when I was racing pro. I got so many, so much archive on tape it's crazy, but I was always watching every race after after every lap and looking for feedback, looking looking what I have could have done differently, looking at other riders' tendencies. If I go outside, what does the guy behind me do? What's his what's his track speed like? What's his what does he prefer? What's his preference in terms of passing? Is it down a straightaway with speed, or is it tacked by going underneath me in the corner? Right. Danny Booby says defensive riding, looking for shadows, listening, getting to know the other riders. Yes, humans follow routine. If a high low, if the high low, they will move more likely to do that all the time. Yeah, so yeah, at the end of the day, it's almost like poker, like learning someone's tendencies, learning their characteristics, understanding their strengths, understanding their weaknesses. Are, are they stronger in the corners and slower in the straights, right? Maybe if they're stronger in the corners, maybe it might behoove you to wait uh, to wait to make that pass and make it down a straightaway, right? Maybe you might want, if, if that's the case, maybe you might want to enter the turn with, with the strategy of coming out with more speed rather than just going for a move and coming out with no speed. Good stuff. Jeffrey Roden, when I say play, it means run in the ditch with friends, right? They're off the bike, right? And they're, they're somewhere else on the track and probably creating, um, you know, trying to, trying to make, yeah, trying to make dust. 
Uh, let's see here. Let's see. Eric Rowe, what's up, coach? Days Rock says, help the channel, guys. Hit the like button. It helps the channel get promoted by YouTube. Hashtag BMX Racing. Thank you, Days. Appreciate that, man. Um, Jacob James says, I see the other riders shadow during during night races. That, that keeps me hustling and on the defensive. Yeah, I think it's good because like you're able to use that to your advantage. It's giving you feedback, right? Like, you know, we, we can't race with a radio in our head and have someone in the stand say, go left, go right. And certainly, you know, you, you can't race with a mirror to watch what's going on behind you either. So, yeah, so sometimes you have to listen for the announcer and, and, and sometimes you have to develop that sensory acuity, that kinesthetic feeling of someone being close to you. If you guys are wearing goggles, man, peripherally, it's hard. I, I never cared for racing with goggles. I think, it's, I think goggles are great. You know, there's lots of pros and cons. It protects your eyes. If you're wearing contacts, it keeps it from drying out. Um, but at the end of the day, I think you lose peripheral vision. Um, that's just my opinion. And so I prefer not racing with goggles and I, and I love to be able to see, you know, what's to the right or left with me without giving it away. Cool guys. Well, Hey, um, six we're an hour into this stream here. Um, man, this was great. I, I love the interaction. Love you guys interacting. If you guys are watching this on the replay, make sure that you guys like the video. Leave a comment below. Let me know what tactics you guys are using. And also make sure you guys subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell. That way you guys get notified uh, when I go live or when I post. Hey guys, listen, make sure all you guys in the live chat, share this video. You know, you know my goal, you know my steez. It's all about helping the newer and younger riders and also the struggling experts out there that are new to our sport. And the more that we can help these guys, the longer they're going to stay around. Again, my goal and passion is to help all you guys thrive, experience your potential and sustain it. Again, thank you so much for showing up. I am grateful for the opportunity to be your coach. You guys have a wonderful week and I'll see you guys next Tuesday and I'm out.